Here are the soil block beets that we planted in uh, the soil block video of a couple of weeks ago. They're looking really great. Uh, the early wonder beets seem to be germinating faster than the generic seed packet. I sometimes think they make those seed packets with like all the leftover seeds that they have. And some of them might be a little old, but they are germinating. They're just really slow. And this is spinach. You can see they've started to get their true leaves. Now, take a look at this seedling. See how the seed is still attached to the first leaves? So the first leaves aren't really part of the uh, eventual plant. It's those little tiny leaves coming out below. Those are called their true leaves. You can see it better on this one. Look how cool that is. And then we've got some marigolds growing here. And down here, the Genovese basil has not made an appearance yet. Won't be long though. And my sunflowers on the right, I have mammoth sunflowers, and I have a variety called Incredible, and another variety called Solar Eclipse there in the back. And these are my mustard greens. They're also getting their true leaves. You can see it on this one right here. You can see the true leaves in the back. If I put my finger behind it. And then these are zinnias. They're looking really good. This one on the right is giant lilac, and these are profusion cherry zinnias. And here are my brassicas. They're looking great. I think I just sowed some chamomile in here. They haven't made an appearance. Uh, my brassicas are purple sprouting broccoli. Uh, that's in this row. And then gypsy broccoli and storage number four cabbage. And then over here I have leeks. I think you'll notice when you look at my plan later on that I don't actually have the word leek written in there, but they'll go wherever the onions go. And down here I have some peppers, bell peppers. My Tulsi basil is coming, coming along. I sowed it kind of thickly, but I'll separate them and shear those plants out. And then some dill, we use a lot of dill here. And I don't know if you can see that, but that's a little bukinia pepper right there. It's a tiny little yellow spicy pepper. And it's a hybrid, so I'm not sure I'll get the same plant, but we'll give it a try. And my onions looking great. That's vermiculite on top, keeps it nice and moist. And these are the overwintered peppers. They actually look really good, right? They have no idea that when they get planted in the greenhouse, they're gonna get chopped down and pruned. But um, this is awesome because that's cayenne pepper and long green fryer, and that'll give me a great head start on a pepper harvest this year. Hi everybody, it's Kim from Patriot Garden. I'm here in the perennial bed, just checking to see what spring is bringing. Things are starting to pop up, it looks glorious in here. Uh, but first we're gonna take a look at my garden planning technique uh, for the year. And at the end of the video, I'll share with you how I did that garden plan. But before we get started, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the like button and the bell for notifications. So now let's take a look at some garden planning. Okay, so everybody, this is my garden plan. This is the whole layout. I'm gonna start talking about the greenhouse and we'll go through the whole thing and I'll tell you about uh, what my plans are for each area and hopefully you'll get some good ideas. The first thing to notice are the dark black arrows that I'm using to map the path of the sun over my garden. My house faces about southeast um, the sun rises in the front of the house and moves to the back. And as you can see, these areas from the black line to the right are the first to get sun. And then I've put the times approximately around where the sun begins to hit. So it comes this way and then as it clears the house, it starts to move this way. Now that means that my tomatoes are going to get sun starting at 1030. I know that's a risk but I'm willing to take that. And further on in the video, you'll find out why. My greenhouse is gonna be where I put my peppers and my melons. And I think they can handle the heat and I have no place else to put them. I mean, that tends to drive a lot of my decisions. I'm out of room. So uh, the peppers and melons are gonna go in there and we'll keep our fingers crossed. We're gonna try this out. In these two beds, I'm doing something different. I'm putting brassicas in. I'm putting in gypsy broccoli, traditional broccoli heads, and I'm also gonna grow some purple sprouted broccoli. It'll just sprout all year and I'll pull off the shoots as needed. They are great companions to beets and onions. I'm also going to have my traditional peas in the early season and again in the late season. If the peas finish and I have time for a cucumber crop that is vining, I might go ahead and do that. 
These two beds are my uh, cold frame beds. So there are things growing in them all winter. I'm going to put another trellis here. I generally put a trellis in the middle here for beans. I'm going to be growing some spaghetti squash. Carrots are traditionally the crop that I put in here. I succession grow carrots throughout the year and then I overwinter them in the cold frame bed. Now rutabagas I have never planted before. I can put my rutabagas with my carrots and we'll see how that that works out. Tomatoes are going to go in these two front beds and then an early and late crop of radishes will also get thrown into that bed. Uh, here and here there will be container gardens lifted off the ground using some cement blocks and wood and I'm going to try to put some bush style cucumbers uh, on this side and the only beans I'm growing this year are bush wax beans. I have an older bed here in front of the run and a new root stout bed right here on the side of the run. The reason why I put beds close to the run is twofold. Uh, number one, there's a chain link fence there, which means things that need a little structure. So for instance, last year I grew birdhouse gourds in this front bed and they grew up and over the chicken run chain link fence. So it provided the birdhouse gourds with some structure to grow on and it also shaded the run because as you can see that run gets a lot of sun from very early in the morning through the rest of the day. Last year I had my sunflowers here and you may have heard me in a previous video say that I watched from my window as they just right before they bloomed were chopped in half by hurricane winds. So I'm putting my sunflowers here so I can tie them to the run if need be. I'm going to actually put my sweet potatoes here. Because it is a new Ruth Stout garden, I expect to have to mound it this year and next year, and then it'll turn into a nice in-ground bed. And of course, zinnias. Zinnias have to be in my life everywhere. This Ruth Stout row here is my older one, along with the Ruth Stout circle. These have been here for two seasons already. This will be the third season. The ground underneath is now really broken down. I have used this as my dumping ground. When I have a half bag of compost, I throw it in there. I mounded my potatoes the last couple of years with whatever I had available. I typically grow about 60 pounds of potatoes in that row. Uh, pumpkins have traditionally grown in this circle. I have been able to put away probably about 10 quarts of pureed pumpkin from that circle. This year I'm going to add winter squash and I'm going to grow them vertically. So these green lines are where I'm going to put my trellises. This Ruth Stout garden over here is brand new. I just put the hay down last fall. I've never grown raspberries before. Um, I don't expect to have a harvest this year but I'm going to mound that really high with compost for two reasons. Number one, I think the raspberries really like that well-drained soil, so a good mound is probably always a good idea for raspberries, and also because being a first-year Ruth Stout garden, that soil is not going to be broken down enough. Now this bed right here is brand new. This is our tea garden. You may have seen the pictures of it in previous videos. I also have this little plot right here. It's not very big. Uh, it is not surrounded by anything, but it's really close to the house. I'm going to take a chance to put my kitchen tomatoes, my favorite flowers, zinnias, and some marigolds for pest protection for the tomatoes. So there's a small perennial bed here, and there's a large perennial bed here with my bee balm. Those will stay. And we're hoping to build a pergola this year. And I think we've already talked about that I'm going to transplant my grapes from the side of the house to over this pergola. And we're going to see how that works works out. It's important to have a good resource uh, to go to when you need to make decisions about intercropping or uh, putting companion plants together in a bed. I've used these two resources and I will provide a link in the description for them for you, but resources like this are really easy to find. Remember, plants can hurt each other, ignore each other, or help each other to thrive and you want to make good decisions. Girls and I are in the garden and I'm just about to plant some pelleted carrot seeds. So tomorrow I'm going to share with you what that looks like. I'll make another video on uh, different techniques for planting carrots. So watch for that video tomorrow. Hope this was all helpful for you. But I really want to get planting. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Happy gardening everybody.